This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. We're in the series Taunting Terrors, where I detail cases of criminals who, after already committing horrific murders, then contact their victims' families to taunt and terrorize them. In this episode, I'll tell you a story that could be considered the Jean Benet Ramsey case of France. A little boy goes missing, is tragically found murdered soon afterwards, and there is no shortage of suspects. But the twist in this story comes when the family begins receiving anonymous communications from someone claiming to have killed the child out of revenge. This is the case of little Gregory and the killer known as The Crow. In 1984, Jean-Marie and Christine Viamy were a young couple just starting their lives together in the small French village of Lepange. The bucolic village, located at the foot of a small mountain range near the German border, was home to just over 1,000 residents. Most of the villagers worked in area mills that produced iron, steel, or textiles. Jean-Marie Viamines had been raised in Lepange alongside over 100 relatives. The Viamines were a family of factory workers, and Jean-Marie held a position in an auto upholstery factory for several years. He was smart and what employers thought of as management material, well-spoken, authoritative, and driven. By the age of 25, he had been promoted to a foreman position, which came with a $15,000 annual salary. Jean-Marie's wife, Christine, had been raised in another village, and when she married her husband and moved to Lepange, she was considered a social climber. The Via Means were a prominent family in the tiny village, with several of them rising to the top socially and financially, earning positions as foremen or supervisors in their factory jobs. I'd imagine that in such a small town, any Via Mean man was considered a catch. So Christine had then stolen away one of the few eligible bachelors and there seemed to have been some resentment towards her by the villagers because of this. But even the Viamine family had problems accepting Christine. In their eyes, she was from an inferior social class and just not good enough to be a Viamine. Even so, Christine and Jean-Marie were happy, and their happiness only increased when their first child, a son they named Gregory, was born in 1980. Christine also provided income for the family, earning wages from her textile mill job. With Jean-Marie's promotion, they were able to build their dream home, a large construction near the edge of the woods, which had cost approximately $50,000. This alone might have caused other villagers to become jealous, but some reports also suggest that 26-year-old Jean-Marie liked to brag about his new home and the new furnishings he was filling it with, such as new leather sofas and an oak dining room set. Some began talking behind his back about his social climbing ways. He was even given a name, Le Chef, literally the chief, but a snarkier translation might be Mr. Big. Again, the consensus among other residents of the town was that Jean-Marie and Christine had gotten too big for their britches. They were putting on airs, and jealous townspeople translated this as a couple thinking themselves superior to others. But this kind of jealousy and animosity towards the Viamine family was nothing new. In 1979, Albert Viamine, Jean-Marie's father and the family patriarch, began receiving anonymous phone calls at his home. These calls made various threats and accusations against him and his family. They chided him for being arrogant and criticized him for mistreating other family members by playing favorites. The calls came over a period of weeks before the police were called in and tapped his phone line. Soon after they did so, the calls stopped. The caller, they realized, had inside information about the Viamine family. This was even more apparent when soon after the calls ended, unsigned letters began arriving. Several letters, handwritten and in what was described as low-born slang, landed in Albert Viamine's mailbox. Details of the family's finances, day-to-day activities, and relationships were included in the letters. The media picked up the story about the harassing letters and phone calls directed at the Viamine family. They dubbed the letter writer Le Corbeau, or The Crow, after a 1943 French film in which a village was terrorized by anonymous letters from a person calling himself The Crow. Aside from all the general threats, 
it was very clear that the Crow especially hated Jean-Marie. He singled him out as the most conceited and arrogant member of the family, and even advised Albert to disinherit him. The letters became more frequent and more vicious beginning in the spring of 1981, soon after Jean-Marie's promotion at the factory. The letters were mostly sent to Jean-Marie's home, but also to his job and his parents. The letters now threatened rape against his wife Christine and even physical harm of his infant son Gregory. When the Viamines moved into their new home and connected the phone line, they only gave the number out to a few family members and close friends. They then began receiving threatening phone calls, confirming the suspicion that the crow was someone they were closely connected to. But the voice on the other end could not be identified. It sounded like a male, but he was definitely altering his normal voice. Some of these calls were tape recorded, but for some reason, they were never traced to find out where they originated from. These messages mostly threatened Jean-Marie, or the boss, as the caller identified him. I hate you so much, the day you die, I will spit on your grave, was a typical hate-filled communication. The final message was received at 5.32 p.m. on October 16th. Michel Viamine, Jean-Marie's brother, answered the phone that evening, and the voice at the other end of the line said, I have taken the chief's son and put him in the volon. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Everly Well. Everly Well offers something really unique and important, and that's a way for you to get answers about your health needs and issues in a simple, convenient way that puts you in control. Everly Well offers more than 35 at-home lab tests, including food sensitivity tests, heart health tests, thyroid, and more. A few years back, I had an ongoing health issue that was really hard to diagnose. I saw many doctors, including specialists, had blood drawn upteen amounts of time to test for various things, and it still took the better part of a year before I had any answers. It was really frustrating. If you've ever been there or been through this with someone you love, you know how that feels. That's why I'm so impressed with Everly Wells at-home lab test kits. They offer more than 35 different lab test kits that come with super easy-to-follow instructions. Collect your samples in the privacy and convenience of your own home, then ship it to Everly Wells Certified Lab for free. After it's processed and reviewed by a board-certified physician, you'll receive your results digitally in just a few days. You'll get a detailed breakdown of what your results mean, and you can even set up a free discussion with one of Everly Wells healthcare professionals if you like. To start getting the information you need to take control of your health, check out Everly Well at-home lab tests today. And my listeners can get 15% off an Everly Well at-home lab test by visiting everlywell.com slash once and enter code once at checkout. That's everlywell.com slash once and use code once for 15% off your test. People love native deodorants. Did you know that they have over 8,000 five-star reviews? Well, it's true, and here's why. Native deodorants are formulated without aluminum, parabens, or talc, and they really work. It's been a long, hot summer, my friends, and I can attest to the fact that native deodorants made with safe, simple ingredients outlast my longest days. You probably know that aluminum found in most deodorants has been linked to some serious health ramifications. You don't have to worry when you put native deodorants on your body, and I think that's aces. Also, I love the fragrances. I love good-smelling stuff, don't you? My favorites are coconut and vanilla and mandarin and white peach. But you may like cucumber and mint, or guess what's new and flying off the shelves? Pumpkin spice latte scent. No kidding. But even if you're an unscented kind of guy or gal, Native's got you covered too. All equally effective, so go crazy. And you can really go crazy with my discount code. For 20% off your first purchase, visit nativedeodorant.com and use promo code ONCE at checkout. That's nativedeodorant.com and use offer code ONCE for 20% off your first purchase. Thanks, Native. They're so generous. And thanks for supporting the show. October 16, 1984, was a typical day in the Viamine home. Four-year-old Gregory had been dropped off at childcare by Christine on her way to work in the morning. Jean-Marie was also at work that day. Christine left her job just a few minutes before 5 p.m. and picked up her son before arriving home a few minutes later. Christine went inside to do some chores while Gregory played in the sandbox in the front yard. No more than 10 minutes later, 
Christine went outside to check on her son, but he was gone. She began searching the immediate area, and not finding him, she canvassed the neighborhood, thinking he might have wandered off in search of a playmate. But no one had seen little Gregory. At just after 5.30 p.m., Michel Viamine, Gregory's uncle, received a call from the crow. I have taken the chief's son and put him in the Boulogne, the gruff voice said before hanging up. Meanwhile, still unable to find Gregory, Christine called the local police and then her husband telling him to hurry home. When he arrived, he, Christine, and the police combed the woods behind their home. Gregory was described as four years old with curly brown hair. Christine had covered Gregory's curls with a wool cap when he'd gone outside to play as it had begun to get chilly. Now the night grew dark and cold, and the Viamines were frantic to find Gregory before anything terrible happened. They were worried he could fall in the dark or maybe be set upon by an animal in the woods and could not stop their minds from racing to these terrible possibilities. But they could not even fathom how terrible the actual outcome would be. Some would later speculate as to why they were searching in the woods when a threatening call had already come, stating that little Gregory had been put in the Valogne, the river that ran through the town. Perhaps they had grown accustomed to the threatening phone calls that they'd received for years and no longer believed the caller was actually serious about causing them harm. Perhaps it was just wishful thinking that this was an ordinary incident of a child wandering away while playing and Gregory would be found at any moment, cold and hungry perhaps, but safe. But sadly, around 9.30 p.m., the little boy's body was found in the Valonia River, seven kilometers or four miles from where he was last seen. His hands and feet had been bound with string and the woolen cap had been pulled over his face. The next day, the cruelest communication of them all was delivered to Jean-Marie's workplace. A letter arrived that read, I hope you die of grief, boss. It's not your money which will bring back your son. The murder of little Gregory was picked up by the media, and by the next day, reporters and news cameras descended on the small village. Everyone wanted to get the scoop on the story of small-town bad blood that began with a poison pen letter and ended with the drowning of an adorable curly-headed boy. Townspeople were asked by reporters to speculate on likely suspects. Photographers fought to get the first pictures of the grieving parents, and Jean-Marie and Christine were even offered money to get exclusive pictures of their precious child in his coffin. They refused. The story of the crow and Petit Gregory would become a fixture in French newspapers and on television news programs for some time to come. The twists and turns in this case would keep it in the news for decades. Problems with the investigation into the death of little Gregory Viamine would begin immediately, making it difficult to determine who was ultimately responsible for his murder. Jean-Michel Lambert, the first examining magistrate who would oversee the preliminary inquiries into the matter, was 33 years old and somewhat inexperienced as a judge. Because of this and the numerous mistakes that were made under his tenure, he would be dubbed Le Petit Juge, or the Little Judge, by the media and the public. His first mistake was being seduced by the spotlight. He made himself available to all hungry reporters and television cameras and gave many ill-advised interviews. Right away, he made the statement that this would be a simple open-and-shut case. He would come to greatly regret these words. Many immediately pointed to the anonymous Crow as the number one suspect in the murder, but of course, he had yet to be identified. Most believed he would be uncovered as a Viamine family member, or at least someone closely connected to the family. However, this still included many suspects who either had to be eliminated or verified as having a motive to want revenge on Jean-Marie and Christine. While the investigators were working in this capacity and directed by Judge Lambert to look specifically into the family for suspects, he continued to give daily press conferences. In some of these recorded events, he was coaxed by reporters into releasing the names of witnesses as well as suspects. Of course, this would prove to throw a monkey wrench into the investigation, as some potential witnesses, not wanting to be named publicly, refused to work with the police. Then there were others, pursuing their 15 minutes of fame, who came forward to give dubious information simply to become part of the story. The investigation quickly unraveled. But it wouldn't just be the problematic witness statements that would throw the investigation off track. 
there were many mistakes made during the investigation that would later be widely criticized. First was the incomplete autopsy performed on the body. The medical examiner, convinced upon first glance that the little boy was a drowning victim, didn't bother to examine his stomach or intestines to rule out any other possibilities. Even more problematic, he didn't even examine his lungs to see if water was present to positively indicate drowning. Because of this, later the question would be raised, had Gregory actually died from drowning, or had his already lifeless body been thrown into the river after his death? A syringe with traces of insulin would be found lying on the riverbank not far from where the body was recovered. Some would speculate that if Gregory had been injected with the drug, he could have been incapacitated or even died before being placed in the river. The body had also not been examined for needle marks, so his actual cause of death, something that could have been easily determined had the autopsy been more thorough, instead would remain a mystery. The first suspect to gain the attention of investigators was Jean-Marie Viamine's cousin, Bernard Laroche. Laroche was known to have a long-standing jealousy of his cousin. It was also discovered that Laroche had been orphaned as a boy and raised by Jean-Marie's parents. The cousins had been practically raised as brothers, but even so, it seemed that there was no love lost between the two. Laroche, who'd always felt overshadowed by Jean-Marie, had publicly voiced his dislike for his cousin over the years. It was also possible that he envied his relationship with Christine, as she had once told family members that Laroche had made sexual advances towards her. He was definitely bitter that his cousin refused to recommend him for a job at his factory, even though he was a foreman, and a recommendation from Viamine would have made Laroche a shoe-in for the job. Some even said he harbored resentment against little Gregory. Laroche and his wife Marie-Ange also had a son almost the same age as Gregory, but their son had been born with physical and developmental issues and required extra care, while Gregory was a healthy and robust little boy. Meanwhile, Laroche wasn't doing himself any favors when reporters came calling. He used the opportunity to state publicly how much he disliked his cousin Jean-Marie and made some pretty stupid and damning statements. When asked by Jean Kerr from Paris Match how he felt about the Viamine son being so tragically taken from them, Laroche replied, they got what they deserved. They've paid for what they've done. I'm the poor stupid fool because each time they need me, I come. And they never invite me to their house on Sundays. Because the police had possession of the letter sent by the Crow to the Viamines, a handwriting expert from Paris was called in to analyze them and try to match them with other samples. These included handwriting samples from Bernard Laroche and Jean-Marie's own brother, Michel, who was also said to be jealous of his brother as well as other possible suspects. The handwriting expert reported that, in her opinion, the handwriting on the Crow's letters most closely matched with Bernard Laroche's writing. She also noted that there was an impression left on the letter's paper that needed to be analyzed. Like in the last episode, the imprint was examined using specialized equipment to decipher the letters left behind on the page. Using this technique, a special investigator was able to identify two letters, B and L. Bernard Laroche was the only suspect who had these initials. Another expert was called to do voice match comparisons on the recorded phone calls from the Crow. He determined that the voice, although altered, matched the voice of Bernard Laroche. Now the investigation zeroed in on Laroche and he was interrogated by police. They were hoping for a confession, but they were disappointed. Still, they continued digging into his story to see if they could make a case to prove he was Gregory's murderer. His wife, Marie Ange, was also suspected as an accomplice when she threw suspicion upon herself as a result of some of her actions. She called investigators from a payphone instead of her home phone to report suspects of her own, an elderly couple from the village. She was also closely following the investigation and made several inquiries as to its progress. Investigators then looked into her movements on the day of Gregory's abduction and noted that she had not been at work, but instead called in sick. They also discovered that she had asked Michelle Viamine's wife, Jeanette, with whom the LaRoches were close, not to give details to the police about their relationship. Then, almost convinced that LaRoche was involved in the murder, investigators brought in Marie Ange's 15-year-old sister, Muriel Boul, for questioning. Muriel lived with her sister and brother-in-law and was an occasional babysitter and nursemaid to the LaRoches' young son, Sebastian. 
it didn't take long for Muriel to implicate her brother, Bernard Laroche, with her account of the day of Gregory's disappearance. She told investigators that on the afternoon of October 16th, Laroche picked her up from her school in his car and said he had a job for her. She said they drove to the Viamines house and picked up little Gregory from his yard. Bernard then drove them to the village of Docelles, about five kilometers away. Muriel said she'd never met Gregory before, and this at first stumped the investigators, who theorized that she'd been brought along to pick up Gregory because she would be a calming presence to the boy. However, later they learned that LaRoche's young son was also in the car, and Muriel may have simply been needed to keep an eye on him. Gregory knew and was fond of his uncle Bernard, and probably went out of Bakht at getting in the car with him, his son, and another young girl. Muriel said that once they reached the other village, LaRoche parked the vehicle while she and Sebastian remained in the car, while LaRoche and the boy walked away behind a tree line toward the river. She did not see Gregory after that, she said. LaRoche returned to the car alone. Muriel then was shown a picture of Gregory and positively identified him as the boy they'd picked up that day. They also showed her one of the crow's letters, and she identified the handwriting as belonging to Bernard LaRoche. The girl was then brought before Judge Lambert and told him the same story. That same day, November 5th, Bernard LaRoche was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and murder. But soon after Judge Lambert declared victory, saying that the number one suspect in the murder of little Gregory had been arrested, he was upstaged by another media exclusive. LaRoche's wife, Marie-Ange, called the press to her home, where her sister Muriel gave a live interview recanting her previous statement to the police. She now said that none of what she told them or the judge was true, but she'd only implicated her brother-in-law because she'd been coerced by the police. The judge was criticized by investigators for allowing Muriel to return to her sister's home, where it was presumed she had had time with the girl to work up a story about a false confession to save her husband. Investigators now looked into Muriel's new story, in which she said she had not been picked up from school by LaRoche, but had taken the bus as usual. They asked her to describe the bus driver, and she told them that he was bearded and wore a mustache. This fit the description of the regular driver of the route, but it was determined that he had not been driving the bus that day. Another driver, a man who was clean-shaven, had taken his place. This driver said that Muriel had not ridden on the bus that afternoon. Additionally, two students from Muriel's school said that after school on October 16th, they had witnessed Muriel get into the car driven by a dark-haired man with a mustache, a description that matched Bernard LaRoche. LaRoche remained in jail as the investigation continued. The police were becoming increasingly frustrated in their investigation due to the inexperience and incompetence of Judge Lambert. He had failed to follow proper procedures, which had weakened their case. Interviews had been conducted and statements given without a third party present, as was required by French law. Important documents had not been added to their case files in order to make them eligible to be submitted as evidence once the case went to trial. For example, two of their most important pieces of evidence the report made by the handwriting expert who identified Bernard LaRoche's handwriting as matching the Crow letters and the analysis of the BL imprint on the letters were now ineligible to be admitted into evidence. Another big misstep, this one the fault of the investigators, was that instead of making duplicate copies of the tapes the Crow's messages were recorded on, they repeatedly played the original tape. As a result, the audio recordings were degraded to such an extent that they became practically unintelligible. Judge Lambert had also begun sharing with the media his skepticism that Muriel was credible in implicating LaRoche in the murder. He said she was of low intelligence and starved for attention. Coming forward as a witness to the biggest murder case in France made her feel important, perhaps for the first time, he believed. He told the media that, in his opinion, her confession was of little value and accepted her retraction of her previous statement. Instead, he began looking into other rumors floating around that Christine Viamine herself may have been responsible for the murder of her son. Three women who worked under Christine at the textile mill reported that they'd seen her drive in the direction of the post office just before 5 p.m. on the day Gregory had been abducted. However, no one saw her go into the post office. A trip to the post office that day would have been significant 
because the last crow letter was posted there that day. The timestamp on the postmark was 5.15 p.m., at which time investigators knew Christine was already home. Even so, they did not inquire of the postmaster if the letter had been posted as soon as it came in or minutes later. Christine was interviewed and she admitted she had been at the post office and mailed a letter, but it had been the day before her son was taken. This letter was found and determined it had nothing to do with the case. Still, the big-mouthed judge gave the press enough reason to begin speculating about Christine's involvement in Gregory's murder. The police were incredulous that Lambert was taking the investigation in another direction when they believed they had enough on LaRoche for a conviction. On February 4th, under the protest of the investigators, Judge Lambert allowed Bernard LaRoche to be released on bail. The judge next called in another set of handwriting experts, whose analysis concluded that Christine was the likely writer of the Crow's letters. Goes to show you how unreliable handwriting analysis can be, which is the reason it's not admissible in many courts today. Judge Lambert ordered Christine brought in for interrogation. She adamantly proclaimed her innocence, even after nine hours of questioning. Christine was now pregnant, and being grilled by the police caused her to become so distressed that she had to be rushed to the hospital. The infighting between the local police and Judge Lambert became so contentious that the judge decided to take the case away from them and handed the investigation over to detectives of the National Police. The chief investigator for the National Police began the investigation from scratch and decided to focus on Christine Viamine as a suspect. He thought he might get her to crack by leaking information to the media that she was soon to be arrested for the murder of her son. When Jean-Marie and Christine heard the news over a radio broadcast, the shock caused enough stress to her body to put her now-advanced pregnancy in danger. She was hospitalized once more. Lambert was not sympathetic, sending a statement to her while she was in her hospital bed that she was now under formal investigation for the murder of Gregory. At this, Jean-Marie grew enraged. Grieving for his son and worried for his wife and unborn baby, he was coming apart. So when a journalist got a hold of Muriel's interview tape implicating his cousin Bernard LaRoche and played it for him, it was enough to send Jean-Marie over the edge. On March 29th, he traveled to LaRoche's home with a hunting rifle. As LaRoche stepped outside and onto his front lawn, Viamine raised the rifle and shot him once in the chest, killing him in front of his wife and father-in-law. Jean-Marie ran off and, before turning himself into police, went to see his wife in the hospital to tell her what he had done. Viamine was arrested and charged with LaRoche's murder. When Christine left the hospital, she went to stay with her parents while the investigation continued. That summer, Lambert ordered the Viamine residence searched. In the cellar, string was found that was said to be a match for the material found binding Gregory. On July 5th, Christine Viamine was arrested and placed into custody. Christine's guilt or innocence was debated by the public. She had supporters who took it upon themselves to investigate if she would have had time to travel from her home to Dossel, where Gregory was said to have been put into the water. They concluded that it would not have been possible, given the time that witnesses reported seeing her on that day. Others believed her guilty, although the motivation for Christine to kill her child was somewhat ambiguous. Judge Lambert simply called it a fit of madness. Psychiatrists were called to examine her, but no psychosis or other psychological abnormalities were found. A dozen days after her arrest, the district attorney intervened, and finding that there was little evidence to hold her, ordered her release. In October 1985, a year after Gregory's death, Christine gave birth to another boy she named Julien. In December, Christine still had to go before the court as the murder charge was still in effect. Her attorney requested the charge be withdrawn, and the case was sent to the Court of Appeals for a ruling. The appeals court judges reviewed the entire case, and after finding numerous procedural errors in the investigation, removed Judge Lambert from the case. It was then assigned to a more experienced judge, Maurice Simon, president of the appeals court of Dijon. The investigation was now handed soberly and without fanfare. Simon started from scratch in the summer of 1987 and would remain in charge of the investigation for the next four years. He would have over 170 witnesses interviewed, and his investigation seemed to place suspicion back on Bernard LaRoche as the most likely suspect. 
On Christmas Eve, Judge Simone allowed Jean-Marie Viamine to be released on bail. He remained free until his trial for the murder of Bernard Laroche was held in November of 1993. Viamine pled guilty and was sentenced to five years with one year suspended, but due to time already served, he was released after serving only a few weeks. Judge Simon was given high praise for taking a completely muddled investigation and restoring it to some semblance of sanity. Even so, with LaRoche dead and no real evidence pointing to Christine as the killer, the case came to a standstill. Judge Simon, who became seriously ill while overseeing the Gregory Viamine case, had a series of heart attacks and died on May 24, 1994. Jean-Marie would later say that he and Christine finally felt like someone cared about getting justice for them and their son when Judge Simone was appointed to oversee the case. He would be forever grateful to the judge and would later name one of his sons Simone. The court dropped the murder charges against Christine Viamine in 1993, almost a decade after her son's murder. Her lawyer proclaimed it a total rehabilitation for his client. The following year, she was awarded 410,000 francs, or approximately $70,000, in compensation for her wrongful arrest. Judge Simone had left the court when his health began to decline, and the case was then assigned to a third judge. This judge again ordered a handwriting analysis, and it was his opinion that the handwriting in the Crow letters was similar to the samples from Bernard LaRoche. However, officially, the case remained unsolved. In 2003, almost two decades after little Gregory's death, new hope was infused into the case with the possibility of DNA testing. Saliva found on the stamp of the final Crow letter was tested to see if the killer's identity could finally be revealed. However, it turned out to be inconclusive, as the sample was too degraded and had been handed by too many people over the years. Christine and Jean-Marie had moved out of the village and resettled in Etampes, southwest of Paris. They now had three children, Julienne, Simone, and Emmeline. In 2008, they asked for the case to be reopened. With DNA testing becoming more advanced, they hoped that the string used to bind Gregory might yield valuable evidence. The tests were conducted, but came back inconclusive. In 2013, more DNA testing was attempted on Gregory's clothes and shoes, but the results were also inconclusive. Then, just in 2017, 33 years after the crime, an arrest was made in the murder of Gregory Viamine. The prosecutor in Dijon, Jean-Jacques Bosque, announced that Gregory's great-aunt and great-uncle, Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob, now in their 70s, had been arrested and placed under formal investigation, charged with kidnapping and confinement, followed by death. The prosecutor stated, Gregory was kidnapped from his parents' home and held for a certain time before his death. The investigations and analyses show that several people cooperated together in the commission of this crime. Just a few days after this announcement, Muriel Bull, now 48, was also arrested and charged with Gregory's kidnapping and murder. Their arrests came on the heels of a more modern analysis of the letters, including handwriting and forensic linguistics investigations into the letters and voice recordings. Upon studying the voice recordings with this new technology, Investigators now believed that the calls had been placed by both a man and a woman. 100 witnesses were re-interviewed or interviewed for the first time, and over 10,000 pieces of evidence were run through an artificial intelligence program called Anacrim that, among other things, can find inconsistencies in statements and alibis. Judge Jean-Michel Lambert, upon his retirement, wrote an autobiography titled The Little Judge, in which he laid out his case for Christine Viamine's guilt. Soon after the charges against the Jacobs were announced, criticisms of the initial investigation was reported on with renewed interest. Not long afterward, Lambert was found dead in his home of suicide. He'd placed a plastic bag over his head and suffocated. Investigators now believe that Bernard Laroche and his clan, or group of close family members, conspired to kidnap and kill Jean-Marie and Christine's son, motivated by jealousy and revenge. Marcel and Jacqueline Jacob, were LaRoche's aunt and uncle. Muriel Bull was released but remains under court supervision. It's believed that she was a witness and had knowledge of the planning of the crime. Investigators believe that her original statement to police, 
that she was driven by LaRoche to the Via Means, where he kidnapped Gregory, was true, and she was bullied by her sister and brother-in-law to recant her statement. She continues to say that her statement was coerced and denies that she was forced to change it. The Jacobs also deny that they were involved in Gregory's murder and say there is no evidence against them. They remain in custody, and all of France waits anxiously for the outcome of their trial, as do Jean-Marie and Christine Viamine, who hope that they will finally discover who is responsible for the murder of their son. Christine Viamine wrote and published a book titled Let Me Tell You, about the family's ordeal through the long years she was under suspicion and the aftermath of Gregory's death. Later, the court would order her to give the proceeds from the sale of the book to Bernard LaRoche's children. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I want to thank Jen Piercy for her help with the French pronunciations in this episode, but any less than perfect reading of those names by me is clearly my own fault. I did my best, but a fluent French speaker I definitely am not. Thanks, Jen. I also want to thank some very special listeners. First of all, I want to thank everyone who has reached out with their support and kind words as I've navigated this plagiarism issue that I've been thrust into. If you don't know what I'm referring to, I'll direct you to my other podcast, Let's Talk About True Crime, where I dedicated an episode about it. It's a discussion between myself and two other podcasters who have also been affected, Robin Warder from The Trail Went Cold and Stephen Pacheco from Trace Evidence. Many of you have commented that it was very informative and helped give you a clear picture of just what happened. I've included a link to it in the show notes. There have been a few listeners who have really went above and beyond to reach out and show their support, and I want to give them a special thanks. Julie Hall Bowman, Sarah Hornberger, Abby Raymond, Beatrice Leva, and on Twitter, Ariadne Rooney, Emily Fravel13, Kim Wilson, Alyssa Payne, Aida D1, Cash Viz, Anti Nickname, Naptime Nancy Podcast, Christine Louise, and everyone else who I didn't name. Thank you so very much. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. My administrative assistant is Lorena Garcia, and copy editing was done by Crystal Dernan. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>